Oh, welcome to the afternoon track. Our next presentation from Greg Nagy. Oh, sorry, Greg Lee Nagy. Um, Syslog NG, Ryman, and Kibana, and how to monitor with these tools. Uh, is, oh, now it's working. Um, first of all, uh, my talk will be about uh, monitoring with Syslog NG, Riemann, and Kibana, as announced. Um, I'm Gergely Nagy, uh, usually known as Algernon, which can be pronounced by people not from Hungary. So uh, if you want to talk to me after, uh, after the talk, you can find me don't try to pronounce my name, it will, it will not work. <laughs> it never does. Uh, I work for uh, a company called Bonabit. Uh, we are the uh, main developers between, uh, behind uh, Syslogangy. Uh, I'm working on the open source uh, version of it, and I, I'm proud to say uh, I have not touched the commercial version in, about in three years. So, let's begin. Uh, first, a few words about the tools uh, I will be presenting. Syslogangy is an open source event processor and as we like to call it, a Swiss army knife of logging. Uh, whatever you want to do with your logs, you can do it with Syslogangy. Uh, it's been in development since uh, the late 90s. Uh, it has always been uh, open source. It used to have a contributor agreement in the beginning, but we don't have that since about five years. Thankfully, uh, if you are into that kind of thing, we have a commercial offering since uh, 2007. It, has, it is available for all kinds of nasty platforms like AIX, uh, HPUX, uh, Solaris, all kinds of weird, st uh, weird things, but the open source version works there too. Uh, Syslogang can uh, collect logs from all kinds of sources, files, networks, uh, I don't know, databases. Uh, it can parse them according to various rules. It can, of course, do syslog, even Cisco uh, logs and uh, various other uh, things people like to call syslog, which are not. Uh, it can parse JSON, so if you have a quite modern system or an in-house developed application, you can send it to uh, syslogng, it will collect them, parse them, uh, filter them, transform them, whatever uh, way you want before you send it further. Uh, to another application. Uh, it also has a lot of uh, so-called destinations. We can send logs over to other syslog servers. We can place them into files, put them into databases, SQL databases, MongoDB, Redis. We can forward them to uh, Elasticsearch, Riemann, and uh, a lot of other things. Oh, yeah, and it also has a wide variety of plugins, uh, both built into Syslogangy and uh, a few plugins which are distributed separately. Uh, I will have a couple of uh, uh, URLs at the end of my presentation, which will be available uh, after the talk as well. So if you're interested, you can check them later too. Uh, we also have a very sizable uh, helpful and very, very inclusive community, both on Twitter, on mailing lists and forums as well, and IRC too, uh, reasonably recently. Uh, the other tool I will talk about is Riemann. Riemann is, uh, well, a system that monitors distributed systems. It's pretty much an event aggregator with a very powerful uh, stream processing language. Uh, what it does is uh, you send it protocol buffers, events, or well, events formatted uh, into uh, protocol buffers uh, serialization format. Uh, it can aggregate them. Uh, 
it can filter them and to various stuff with them, which I will uh, explain later. So it's much, much more than a collector, and you have a whole language uh, with which you can uh, do very interesting stuff with your data. Uh, this language, by the way, is called Clojure, which is a Lisp language uh, built on the uh, Java virtual machine. Uh, it provides a low latency transient shared state. So uh, it pretty much means you have an index uh, which you can query uh, from outside, uh, which holds the actual state of the uh, data you sent in and which you aggregated. Uh, <coughs> there is uh, the third application I will talk about, which is Kibana. Uh, you will likely hear more about it uh, during the day and the next day. Uh, and there are people much more knowledgeable about it uh, than me uh, on this conference. Uh, I will only touch the surface of Kibana, by the way. Uh, Kibana is uh, a tool with which you can visualize your logs and pretty much any kind of timestamp data. It is a very, uh, very powerful search syntax. It builds on Elasticsearch. Uh, it has a flexible, powerful, and intuitive user interface. I'm not sure how well you can see this screenshot, but this is pretty much how it looks uh, with after a few moments of configuration. So what you can do with these tools and how to uh, plug them together. To know that, first we need to know what we are, what we want to monitor, or what we can monitor. Uh, we can, of course, monitor system set, uh, system states such as um, hard disk space, uh, network bandwidth, uh, CPU usage, uh, memory usage. Uh, the state of the RAID array, uh, the number of uh, virtual, uh, virtual machines running, that kind of stuff. We can monitor application state, uh, either from within the application or with an external program such as uh, CollectD or uh, Nagios. Uh, you can check whether your uh, web, server, web server is running, whether your uh, SMTP server is correctly sending out mail, or if your home-built application is uh, serving your uh, data at a reasonable speed. Uh, you can also monitor exceptions, uh, which is fairly common when you're doing uh, agile development. You just deploy uh, something new and see if anything breaks. Uh, plenty of people seem to like doing this kind of thing. Uh, you can monitor activity. Uh, for example, if you have a website, you can monitor uh, which links people clicked on. Think Google Analytics, which is kind of a monitoring tool as well, uh, except it's from the other side. Uh, then we have the usual tools, Nagios, Collecti, Munin, and of course, we have Riemann. So we have the usual tools. I'm not going to uh, explain all of them. I'm pretty sure most of us uh, have a rough idea what we want to monitor. Uh, and most uh, systems already have some kind of monitoring in place. So what I'm going to offer instead of giving you hints what to monitor is how to bind it together with logging and what that will buy you. Uh, well, this is a kind of logging too, but this is not what I'm with, I will be talking about. Logging is... Uh, it has very 
Uh, so it has a lot of things in common with uh, monitoring. Except with monitoring, you pretty much pull the information out of the application or teach the application to send you uh, events. Uh, with logging, if done right, and very few people and very few projects seem to get that right, uh, what you do is persist application state. You pretty much make an event that at this time of the day, this was the application state, this happened. Uh, it's, it should be kind of like a di uh, diary. Uh, unfortunately, the format is usually application uh, specific. Uh, most of the logs in, out in the wild are unstructured. They have some kind of little structure like either the old BSD syslog format or the uh, slightly improved syslog format which has time zones and uh, beginnings of uh, structured data, or they have an application specific format like uh, HTTP uh, daemons logs, which usually uh, follow whatever example Apache set. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, the uh, MySQL logs or SMTP server logs. Pretty much every one of them is different. And you need a tool to make sense. Uh, out of that. Uh, that too can be syslogng, logstash, uh, there are plenty of them. Uh, what I prefer to use is uh, syslogng, obviously, uh, primarily because uh, that's the light, lightest of them all, which can do what I want. But what you need to know about logging is that it's not just for debugging. Uh, it's not just there to help you figure out what went wrong or what happened. It's a very good source for monitoring too. Because there are a lot of uh, legacy applications which you can't really talk to from the outside. They don't have any interfaces uh, to tell you what happens inside them, the best you can do is look at the log files or events they spit out and try to make some sense out of that. And that is where monitoring and logging comes very nicely together. So, what do we already have? If you have a monitoring system set up, you will always be aware uh, how your systems are behaving. Uh, you will know when some extraordinary thing happens. Uh, if you run out of disk space, you will know. Uh, you can throw pretty graphs, uh, graphs out of it. Uh, you can do reports, alerts, you name it. We have that already. If you have Google Analytics or a similar analytics solution, you know how many visitors you have on your website, you know what they clicked on, uh, you know what browse browsers they use, what kind of uh, equipment they use. Uh, you can be pr pretty sure what I have, uh, whether they have ja uh, JavaScript turned on or off, uh, because if they have it turned off, you will obviously have much less information. What can we add uh, to this mix? What do we have in the logs which are otherwise not av available for most monitoring tools. Well, we have quite a lot of things. For example, we have the HT uh, HTTP servers logs. Why is that useful if we already have Google Analytics? Well, first of all, uh, when 
you meet with a security and privacy conscious user, he will likely have uh, JavaScript turned off or at best uh, most analytics uh, services such as uh, Google Analytics turned off or blocked. But if you have your HTTP logs, you will know uh, what sites he checked, uh, what pages uh, he looked at, where he came from, although that information is a bit flaky. Uh, so if you take that out from the log, uh, log files and pipe it back to your uh, monitoring system, you will have much more information. Information you wouldn't uh, have access to if you didn't have your logs. Or to take another example, you have an SMTP server. Uh, you can easily monitor the traffic on the usual ports, but if you don't, uh, don't have uh, the logs available, uh, the information you have is very limited. Most servers can uh, can be reached through uh, through SNMP or a similar solution, but uh, as far as I found, the logs have much more information. Uh, they have much more information about what went wrong, what the other uh, what the other side uh, said about a reject uh, rejected mail. Uh, how many times uh, it has retried uh, resending a mail, and a lot of other things. If you have an SQL uh, server, uh, those are much better uh, when it comes to monitoring, but uh, there are still a lot of things in the logs which, which are very hard to reach otherwise. Uh, for example, if you want to, during development, uh, see which requests or which comments took the longest time or were executed the most times, uh, one of the easiest ways to reach that information is having a look at the logs. Uh, most programs, most demons, uh, can be configured uh, on the fly to enable and disable logging, or, well, debug logging, or tracing if you prefer. So, when you uh, deploy a new feature or a new software, you can just enable uh, debug logging for a very short time, and then uh, extract useful metrics out of the logs. Which helpful metrics we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, I already touched this part, uh, how we will benefit from all of this. And uh, this is where the interesting part of the talk comes. Uh, unfortunately, I have uh, problems reaching my server, so even though I wanted to do a demo and show it to you on the screen uh, how it all looks. Uh, since my server seems to be offline, uh, we'll have to use our imagination when I describe uh, what kind of things uh, you can put together. So let's go back a few steps. We have a brand new shiny web page just launched, marketing uh, did a very expensive campaign to get the word out. And now you want to see how, how the website uh, fares. On one hand, uh, you have Google Analytics. On the other hand, uh, you have all the little building blocks uh, behind this whole thing. You can uh, take the normal logs from your system, uh, syslog mostly. Uh, you can 
look at all the uh, little programs uh, your system admins forgot to disable when setting up the uh, virtual host quickly. Uh, apart from uh, analytics, you can mix it, uh, mix it up with uh, the HTTP logs, as I mentioned before. Uh, Syslogangy has quite a few tools uh, to help you with that. Uh, we have a feature called uh, ButternDB, which is uh, very similar to uh, Logstash, uh, Logstash's Grok. Uh, it pretty much means you can write your own parsers and extract data uh, out of uh, log lines, which are pretty much unstructured. Uh, we also have a reasonably large collection of, uh, uh, of such patterns. Uh, we have patterns for Postfix, uh, Apache, uh, I believe for MySQL as well, and uh, plenty of uh, other demons. With this, uh, you can extract, for example, from an HTTP log, uh, the visitors, uh, the referrers, and uh, with the help of our uh, Syslogangy's Riemann destination, uh, you can forward it to Riemann, and uh, with Riemann, you can do aggregation on the data. For example, uh, you can tell Riemann that you want to see uh, the last, let's say, uh, 15 minutes uh, of the website traffic, uh, all the IP addresses uh, that visited the site. Uh, you want another metric uh, based on this. Uh, for example, you want to know that at any moment in time, how many of your visitors uh, okay, sorry, I'll start the sentence again. Uh, let's say the site has been running for a few days, and uh, you want to compare how many visitors uh, you have today uh, compared to the same time yesterday, or how many visitors you have uh, today, how many percent uh, more do you need to reach yesterday's performance? Uh, with Riemann, you can do that. You just group together uh, a number of metrics and uh, do all kinds of calculations on them. And uh, when you have all of your logs available, uh, the limits are pretty much endless. You are not limited only to IP addresses. Uh, you can uh, extract uh, the pages people looked at. Uh, you can uh, put that side by side using uh, the graphical use, uh, interface of Kibana. Uh, let me just go back there. Ah, there. So, uh, one of the great things about Kibana is uh, that it can draw pretty graphs, and uh, you can build your queries and your graphs uh, using a web interface. Now, if you pump all your logs into Kibana, and you also pump all your monitoring activity into Kibana, you can set up metrics uh, side by side and uh, then it becomes obvious when something is uh, not right, or if something is uh, very, very right when it comes to traffic, for example. Uh, you can monitor the number of logged in users, uh, show a graph from that, and uh, put it on top uh, of another metric, 
like number of visitors and then you have pretty much then you know how many of your uh, visitors are actually logged in which can be a very useful metric to have too or if you have a web-based shop uh, you can uh, draw a graph about uh, sales and uh, combine it with uh, with another uh, which displays the active um, how do you say it in English uh, so well when you sell a few things cheaper for a limited time uh, discount yeah thank you very much uh, so if you have running discounts uh, and you have the number of logged in users and uh, you also know uh, how many uh, items you are selling from any number of items you can put that together display it and uh, I'm pretty sure the marketing guys on the, or the sales guys would be very happy to see uh, such detailed information because I'm pretty sure it would make their job a lot easier. Uh, by the way, if you have questions, just raise your hand and... Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, kind of uh, let, let me just repeat the question for uh, for the recording. The uh, question was uh, whether uh, everything is put in Elasticsearch. Yes, everything is put in Elasticsearch. Uh, well, most everything. Uh, Riemann has a running index uh, that is contained within Riemann, uh, but everything that goes into the Riemann index also goes into Elasticsearch. And uh, that, rep uh, that representation is what uh, Kibana can uh, query. Mm -hmm. And also performance metrics as well. Perform performance metrics as well, everything. Uh, everything I want to see, uh, I send it to uh, Elasticsearch in the end. Uh, I have syslogng on one end to collect the logs. Uh, I have various collecting tools uh, on the same side, uh, collect the Nagios, whatever, uh, which collect uh, monitoring uh, events from various sources. And uh, all of these are sent to Riemann, which does the aggregation, uh, calculates metrics for me, and uh, sends it forward to Kibana. Sysogenji can all, uh, also uh, send it forward to Elasticsearch. So uh, you have access not only to, uh, to the metrics and uh, the process data, but you also have access to the uh, row logs. And uh, that makes it possible to correlate the two and uh, set up relations between them. Uh, partly. Uh, normalization is uh, partly done in Syslogenji. Uh, when you are reading from unstructured logs, uh, you can send the whole thing uh, as it is uh, to, uh, to Elasticsearch, which is useful in its own right. But uh, if you can extract further information to make sense out of the log, to extract IP addresses, uh, for, or let's take, for example, an SSH login, uh, you can extract uh, where it came from, which user logged in, when, uh, when he logged in, what uh, method was used for uh, logging in, uh, public key, password, that kind of stuff. Uh, which makes the logs uh, even more useful because uh, then you can uh, draw a graph about uh, public key logins versus uh, password logins, uh, which makes it very easy to migrate from one to the other uh, and see how your users are.
dealing with the mig migration, for example. Um, Riemann does uh, another round of normalization. Uh, Siso Genji can do a lot of things, but it's not really good at uh, aggregating and uh, transforming books of data. Uh, it's pretty good at uh, doing that on single log lines or a uh, couple of log lines, but when you have a large body of, uh, of data, Siso Genji isn't terribly good at uh, doing transformations on that. On the other hand, uh, Riemann, which has a very uh, powerful language behind it, uh, and uh, tons and tons of libraries to uh, help you uh, calculate whatever metrics you need, uh, it can do a lot more. Uh, for ex uh, with Riemann, you can do uh, you can do grouping. You can kind of do that with Syslogenji as well, but not not quite as powerful. Uh, with Riemann, uh, you can do fixed time grouping, uh, meaning uh, it takes uh, snapshots at every five seconds and does some calculation on that. You can do moving time uh, grouping, which means it takes the last n seconds or you can do any of these based on the number of uh, events or the last few, ev mm, last few events. Uh, this is something Cecil Genji can't really do, and it wasn't designed to do that. Uh, with Riemann on, on, the other, uh, on the other hand, uh, this is where it excels at. Uh, grouping and uh, so it can group stuff together. It can also uh, take things apart based on uh, properties uh, discovered earlier. Uh, you can uh, split a stream uh, into substreams and to different calculations on them. For example, if you have, uh, let's say, a stream of uh, login events coming in, you can split into split it into two streams: one for uh, privileged user logins and one for normal user logins. For primitive uh, user logins, uh, you can do a metric on uh, how long they stayed logged in, because uh, when a privileged user stays logged in for a long time, that's probably not what you want to see. Uh, on the other hand, when an unprivileged user logs in, you can do a completely different uh, metric. For example, uh, how many links uh, this unprivileged user clicked on the interface. I'm not really sure why that would be useful, but perhaps you are testing a new user interface, so uh, that's an option as well. Uh, so these are the main things Riemann can do for you. And uh, as you can see on the picture, uh, Kibana can display them uh, in a very, very friendly way. And uh, yes, what else did I have? Oh, yeah, exceptions. So, uh, exceptions are an interesting thing. There are many uh, services. Uh, built around uh, handling exceptions and displaying useful data out of them. And uh, with SysLogNG and uh, Riemann, you can pretty much do whatever you want with them. Uh, you can split them by program. Or, well, when you have an exception, how do you handle it? First, you handle it within the program and either crash or try to recover. But most of the time, if you want to be nice to your uh, system administrators, uh, you also store or send those ex uh, exceptions somewhere for uh, debugging purposes and uh, for debugging purposes mostly. 
Now, if you send those uh, exceptions to an outside service, for example, pager duty, uh, duty or uh, sentry, or m any of the uh, many others, uh, they allow you to display the exceptions, do some simple metrics on them, but you don't really have that much control. Uh, with the combination of Sysilganji and Dreamman, you have a lot more control, although it's much less friendly to configure this, uh, because both Sysilganji and Dreamman has to be configured with a text editor, um, most of the time anyway. Uh, but on the flip side, you have more control. And uh, if more control is what you want, this is what you want. Uh, for example, so exceptions. Uh, you can pick the ex uh, exceptions apart uh, line by line. For example, if you have a Java exception, that will be uh, quite a lot of lines. Uh, you can do a metric on how long, how long an exception has been, uh, which is a pretty uh, useful metric you can show to your uh, developers, saying that uh, if you have a stack trace of a uh, couple of hundred thousand lines, uh, that probably means that your program is overly complicated. Uh, that's a metric you normally don't need to use, but I've seen such things and it's terrible. Uh, you can also follow the development uh, of an application based on exceptions. Uh, you can check what kind of exceptions occur. Uh, I.O. exceptions, uh, couple of application specific uh, exceptions and uh, it's very interesting to see how over the development of a product uh, these exceptions uh, start to vary. Uh, in the beginning you'll have lots of IO exceptions because who cares about uh, guarding the IO layer, it will just work and uh, the kernel will take care of it, but once those issues are fixed, you will have uh, other exceptions. Uh, as people start to discover uh, how to use your APIs, they will undoubtedly discover bugs as well. And uh, having a graph of what kind of exceptions occur is very useful for developers. Uh, probably more useful to them than to system administrators. And uh, with Dreamman, it's very easy to classify them. And uh, with a syslogng before Dreamman, it's very easy to uh, collect those exceptions because they have a reasonably standard, uh, well, the exceptions itself don't have a reasonably standard format, but with Sysagenshi you can hammer them into uh, into a format which is useful for Riemann and uh, which is useful for any other tool you may have uh, on your chain. Uh, okay, yes? Uh, that's part of it, yes. Uh, so a transport layer or not so? Um, not so much. Uh, Riemann can pretty much, well, uh, to send events to Riemann, uh, you need to use uh, its own protocol. Uh, it uses uh, protocol, ba uh, protocol buffers uh, serialization format, and uh, it has a few uh, fields within the format like uh, the name of the event, uh, the host it came from, uh, the state, a description, and uh, 
oh, I forgot to mention it, but this is important. Uh, Evans and Riemann have a field called Time to Live, so Evans can expire. And uh, you can set Riemann up so it notices when an event expires and it generates an event uh, when that happens. So, for example, uh, you're monitoring a program uh, which should be running all the time. And if it doesn't send an event for, let's say, five minutes, uh, then the last event from it will expire and when it expires, that can raise another event and uh, you can send an alert uh, based on that information. Uh, or you can do a metric, uh, availability uh, metric, based on how often uh, events expire. Uh, let's say we have uh, a cluster of app servers and you are testing a new load balancer. Uh, so you are looking at the HTTP server logs and collecting uh, how many uh, requests it serves. And uh, you want to know whether the load balancer works and you want to compare the load uh, on each server uh, within the cluster. Uh, and uh, before this load balancer was set up, you knew what the daily traffic of, uh, of your site is, or hourly traffic, or something like that. Uh, so you divide that number by the uh, number of uh, servers you have, and maybe with a little bit more to uh, give it a little moving space. And uh, if you expect there will be a hundred requests a second and uh, you have two servers, then uh, you set the uh, time to live time accordingly. So if the load balancer doesn't work and only sends a request to one of the servers or mostly to one of the servers, uh, then the other will expire and you can through a graph from that and see uh, how well the load balancer works over time. Uh, you can turn knobs on the configuration and see how that affects the performance. Uh, you can also do that uh, with any kind of other application where you can uh, collect performance metrics. Uh, turn a few knobs, send the, uh, all the metrics into Riemann, uh, aggregate and uh, compute uh, the performance over a period of time and display it with Kibana, lay it over each other. Uh, you can do a graph where it shows last, week, uh, uh, last week's performance uh, on the bottom and uh, overlay it with uh, the current week's uh, performance, for example. That's a very useful metric to have as well if you're uh, deploying new features uh, frequently. Okay, um, I believe I said everything I uh, wanted to. Unfortunately, I can't present a demo because my server still appears to be offline. Uh, if you have any other questions, I'm very happy to answer. Uh, otherwise, I'll go to the end of my slides and uh, show you where you can get more information. Yes? Is there any component in this concept is able to queue something like a um, Well, Syslog NG has a built-in queue. Uh, so if you have... Uh, more events uh, coming in than you uh, than you can process, uh, then it can uh, it can queue it up uh, in memory only at the time uh, at this time. Uh, so if you have bursts, it will survive that without uh, without losing logs. Um, 
I'm not sure if Freeman has a queue, but I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, Sysso Genji uh, can also uh, send uh, log events to uh, AMQP. Uh, it's not able to subscribe to AMQP as well, but we're working on that too. So in the near future, you will be able to uh, put a dedicated queue between uh, Sysso Genjis. And uh, then you can have uh, Sysso Genji on the server side, uh, an AMQP broker somewhere else, uh, Sysso Genji client reading from the AMQP uh, servers, and locally forwarding it to your Riemann cluster. Any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, and I'll show you this one more slide with a couple of URLs. Uh, the first one is uh, the website of Sysso Genji with a lot of other pointers uh, to IRC, Twitter, documentation, that kind of stuff. Uh, the second one is uh, the Sysso Genji Incubator, which is a collection of uh, experimental mo uh, module uh, plugins. Uh, for example, the Riemann plugin is in the incubator. The Elasticsearch plugin is in the incubator. Uh, we also have a graphite output uh, in that collection. Uh, we are working on an HTTP source and HTTP destination, which will likely go to the incubator as well. Uh, the incubator also has uh, Lua support, uh, which means you can uh, write uh, sources, parsers, and destinations for Syslogenji without ever having to touch C code uh, purely in Lua. Uh, we are also working on a Python plugin so soon you will be able to uh, write Syslogenji plugins in uh, Python as well. Uh, the last two URLs are uh, blogs. Uh, the bottom one is uh, my company blog. Lots of information about Syslogenji, new features, and what we're working on. And uh, the top one is uh, the blog of uh, one of my colleagues who did a uh, lot of work on the incubator, uh, the Lua, uh, Lua plugins and the graphite output are uh, his work, for example. And uh, yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.